he didn't really kill his mother. He silenced his mother. Right, right. From his point of view, he had to. From his point of view, he was being tortured and tormented and beaten into the ground by this voice that he needed to silence. And it was encouraged to by the voice in his head. You've got to kill me. Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on possibly the greatest drummer who ever lived, Jim Gordon, Psst. along with our very special guest, author and Jim Gordon biographer, Joel Selvin. Coming up, we've got Deer Tick, Bob Nastanovich, Mike Watt rating the entirety of the Minutemen's output, and the Association rating the entirety of their own output over the course of an epic 13-hour interview. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and subscribe. Go ahead, do it! And away we go then with Joel Selvin as we race through the stark, cubist mental state of the talented and tragically troubled Jim Gordon. All-American apple pie young man, perfectly on beat both behind the kit and in his day-to-day, turns, well, schizophrenically induced matricidal murderer. Welcome then to part two of the Jim Gordon series, The Fall of Jim Gordon. Tonight's guest literally wrote the book on Jim Gordon. It comes out in February, and I can't wait to crack it open and sniff down its floridly scented contents. This guy had a legendary column in the San Francisco Chronicle that ran from 1972 to 2009, in addition to books on Ricky Nelson, Ed Hardy, The Grateful Dead, and the number one New York Times bestseller, Red, My Uncensored Life in Rock with Sammy Hagar. Not to mention two books of his that I've read and can vouch for because they're mind blowers. Altamont, the Rolling Stones, the Hells Angels, and the inside story of Rock's Darkest Day, which is an essential companion to Gimme Shelter, and Sly and the Family Stone in Oral History, which is as good a compendium of pages as I've read in a while. The man's doing the Lord's work, yet he's taking time out to do a Drum Pounders Deluxe Deep Dive. Give this badass scribe a bit of your love, because he surely deserves it. Lads and ladies, Joel Selvin! My, my. I believe it's at around this time when his behavior becomes noticeable. The bassist Max Bennett said he was always a quiet guy, but the quiet became very loud and everybody left him alone. Uh, so I guess during breaks at work, he would stand alone in the corner talking to himself in a whisper. That's the kind of thing you can't really explain away. Yeah, there was a point where the shyness melded into an uncomfortable introversion and the struggles that were going on inside Jim to maintain his equanimity and, and to continue to function in the real world were just getting more and more dramatic for him. In 75, he started seeing psychiatrists, but he wouldn't tell them what was going on. He told them that he was depressed about his marriage ending and depressed about his poor relationship with his daughter. But he didn't mention that his head was filled with voices ordering him to do stuff. Classic. Uh, it, it is classic and very typical. But because he was so high functioning, because he had this tremendous professional profile and was operating on such a high level, the medical professionals just were bamboozled. They didn't see beyond his depression and, and just thought, well, this guy's got trouble with drugs and alcohol and depression. They'd give him antidepressant medicine. And this is in the 70s when it's the dawn of psychiatric medicine. Stuff was really heavy-handed, ham-fisted stuff. I don't think it made much difference to him, but it, he absorbed it. He was taking those things along with all the illegal and all, along with all the drinking. Yeah, And it just wasn't maintaining what he needed to do. And so about 75, there are things starting to happen that people notice. And it's like, oh, what's is that, with Jim? It happened as late as 75. I thought it was a couple of years earlier it became noticed. 75 is when, you know, he starts yelling at the hollow note session and is a heavy interest in seeing different psychiatrists. 
In 76, he finally admitted himself to the hospital and confessed that he was hearing voices. 72 to 74 is truly the final flush of his classic session work. You could even make the argument that this is the peak because you're going from the incredible bongo bands, bongo rock, which just Apache alone, there's a movie made about. It's the most frequently sampled drum break ever. It's fundamental to the world of hip hop. It really is. And then uh, an artist who I never cared for a solo, but I understand that Jim's work in this area is crucial for a more music concrete aspect of him. His work with Frank Zappa on Apostrophe is fundamental to Jim's career. Well, that's just a jam from a New York recording session during the Wazoo tour that Zappa edited up into a very exciting instrumental. And yeah, Jim is phenomenal on that piece. Uh, if you were to review the live tapes of the, the Grand Wazoo, Zoo band, which is what, like 25 pieces or something like that. Jim's unbelievable on that. It, it, it Zap is, of course, a combination of reading and improvisation. And so the reading is very demanding, very exacting. And Jim was brilliant at that. The improvisation, no problem. Jim was open and ready for that. So all this Grand Wazoo stuff is out now, both the Grand Wazoo and the subsequent Petite Wazoo. And Jim's just phenomenal on that stuff. He just ate it up. And there, there's nothing else in Jim's catalog like the Zappa stuff. It was symphonic, it was orchestral, and yet it, it was drum-based. Yeah, that's why it seems so important is because he never really got to exercise those chops that much outside of his work with Zappa. And then You're So Vain, honestly, really like the only essential work that Carly Simon ever did, Jim's all over that stuff, you know, from No Secrets, Hot Cakes and Playing Possum, then make some side deviations into soft rock with Summer Breeze, Seals and Crofts, and Albert Hammond's It Never Rains in Southern California, the two Bobby Whitlock records that he did post Derek and the Dominoes. <clears throat> and then there was a slew of good sessions, your favorite, My Maria in 73 and 74 is to me even a higher peak midnight at the oasis is, is a great single rock the boat right at the precipice of the introduction of disco you are so beautiful bringing him back with joe cocker and there's no drums on it. you are so beautiful is he on that record he's though? on some of the album sessions but there are no drums on you are so beautiful okay i'm gonna keep that in the show you know just to underscore my humanity my fallibility <laughs> <laughs> I love his work with uh, Gordon Lightfoot. Sundown's amazing. You know, that kind of brings us to one of the last big things that he did before 75 hits, which is Pretzel Logic. Well, let me tell you about You're So Vain, because that is Jim's masterpiece. And that's his best work? It's his masterpiece. It is the record where Jim's work is the most crucial, most obvious, and most transformational. But Jim was the third drummer on that track. The first time they cut it with Carly's band and... The drummer was Andy Newmark. It wasn't what Richard Perry wanted. So they brought in a British guy and he cut the drum track. It wasn't there yet. Jim is in London with Zappa. He's got one night off. He happens to call Richard Perry, who he knows is in town. Perry says, what are you doing tonight? Come down to the studio. He comes down to the studio. Perry forgot to tell Carly, so she threw a shit fit when she saw Jim Gordon and Frank Zappa at the session. What? Isn't this track done? We already finished this track. And Andy Newmark was there. I spoke to him about this, and, and, and he asked Jim, could he sit in the drum booth while Jim cut the track? Jim said, sure. So Andy sat there for five hours, 60 takes. He said when Jim was done, he had not made a single mistake, and the drum head was cratered like six inches deep. That was the track. When you go back and listen to it, you'll see what Jim did to the pre-chorus with the eighth notes on the floor tom and the stand tom rolling into the cymbal crash is just tease up this chorus in such a brilliant way. And Perry worked on that for five hours to make sure that he had exactly what he wanted on the drums with that track. And that, that's the story on that. The Pretzel Logic story is also pretty interesting because Seely Dan was a record producer named Gary Katz and the two songwriters, Walter Becker and Don Fagan. They were signed to a record deal and they started making a record before anybody knew at the record company. And they said, wait, who are these guys? And really quickly, they grabbed a couple of other musicians and became a group, right? The drummer was okay, but he wasn't what they wanted. So when they come to do their third album, they decide... 
that they're going to workshop their records. They're no longer going to use the unit that they called Steely Dan, but they were going to employ session musicians and work all over this. And the first thing they did was they brought in a drummer. And this guy was a 19-year-old phenomenon from the Sonny and Cher band named Jeff Picaro. Jeff Picaro's father had been a session player, and he went to Grant High School, where Jim's legacy just loomed so large. And he worshipped at the altar of Jim Gordon. And he says to these guys, I don't know why you're hiring me. You should hire Jim Gordon. So they do. And Jim comes in and cuts Ricky Don't Lose That Number. And they didn't let him go. They eventually brought Picaro in and Picaro and Jim do a double drum track. But Prince Logic is all Jim. Was he considered part of the band a la Traffic or Derek and the Dominoes? No, no. They, they, were, they were workshopping. They, they, you know, Chuck right. Rainey's on bass and, right. and Dean Parks is on guitar. Dean Parks, by the way, uh, I asked him about Steely Dan sessions. I said, what were they like? He said, tedious. Yeah, yeah, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, it's a bunch of musos trying to get every note perfect. I love the band, but that's what it was. That could be my favorite Steely Dan record because they hadn't gotten precious with it yet. You know, it wasn't this arid studio-based atmosphere that felt airless. It's still- Antiseptic. I, yeah, yeah. And I don't mind the antiseptic thing because it works with their aesthetic, but Pretzel Logic, it was kind of the peak before they, went down that slide tom murrow who's a, a loyal listener of ours he asks was any major dude will tell you written about jim gordon not to my knowledge okay and he also asks if that is jim gordon walking past in the brown leather coat on the left hand side of the cover of tom waits the heart of saturday night I don't know that either Okay. Jim's on that record. Yeah, yeah, I know. And when he asked that question, I thought that's obscure. But then I looked on the cover. It really does kind of look like Jim. I'll have um, to check that out. By the mid seventies, the wheels started coming off, right? Very much so. The Souther Hillman Foray band is a turning point. He had been so under attack by his condition and it had undermined his confidence. And he wanted to join this band. And he asked if he could audition. And I was like, what? Of course, you know, just take the job. But right from the start, it was not the same Jim. He was remote. He was standoffish. Played great, but he was difficult to deal with. And then when they went out on tour, he was problematic the whole time. I mean, he was violent and throwing stuff at the other guys. And for the first time, his drinking and drug using was starting to affect his playing. And that had never happened before. I know later on there's a, a more famous session where he stops and accuses people of messing with his time. But right at this point, wasn't he stopping in the middle of a take and saying, you're the devil, you're messing with my time? I think that's coming a little bit later. That You know, you're talking about like the Steve Harley episode or the Johnny Rivers thing. There are mystifying moments for everybody that was involved. Right. Um, it's kind of dark humor, but on the other hand, so much pain underneath this. It's hard to see say but dean parks tells about the johnny rivers session and they're just about done they've got a few minutes left they're going to try one more song and jim starts in on this i know what you're doing you stop that dean yeah i know what you're doing you're you're messing my time you're making it so i i can't hit the whole note at the beginning on the one and dean's like what are you talking about and johnny rivers who's the producer as well as the singer he says oh come on jim he can't do that from over there now count off and let's get going. And Jim goes, oh, one, two, three. Right, right. <laughs> right, right. That's how you diffuse schizophrenia with pragmatism. <laughs> I, you know, these people have no idea what they were dealing with. And I you think about this for a minute. It's like the music business in the 70s had so much patience with drug addicts, drunks, sexual deviants, but they couldn't deal with somebody who was actually mentally ill. Hey lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. And so if you're like me and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discography is an entirely listener supported show and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Friday, a Monday wildcard episode, which is either a soul-bearing interview with that week's special guest or an offshoot show like Queasy Listening and Rock Cousteau. And then on Wednesdays, there's 
the humdinger of them all. Discography's the top 10. You got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded. No questions asked. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discography. Now, before we go any further into that part of things, I feel like in order to responsibly activate the audience's empathy at this point, we should talk about the voices because it wasn't just his mom. The leader of the voices, please correct me if I'm mistaken here, was a white bearded man, right? And there was also a blonde woman, another dark haired one. There was his brother, his aunt and his mom, right? It got to be very crowded up there, very crowded. But his mother was the chief tormentor. She was the one who wanted him to cut down his eating and wouldn't let him finish his meals. And everybody was harshly critical. And it got worse and worse and worse. Strangers on the street walking by him would say things to him depressing, discouraging things. You know, he just accepted that. When people accused him of making this up, he said, why would I do that? I want to eat. Let's talk about the eating. So his mother would make him eat half his food at first? Jim had uh, issues around weight all his life. He experienced um, shame over putting on weight, and he had a tendency to put on weight. He was never like a skinny guy. He was a big guy, 6'4", and he'd get up there. So in his mind, his mother wanted him to not eat because then he wouldn't be fat. And that was a subject of shame for him. So his mother would make him stop eating in the middle of a meal. You say, oh, how does she do that? Well, this is uh, one of the most severe symptoms in all the mental illness called command hallucinations. And what it is, is you have been ordered to do this. And if you don't do it, you will experience severe pain. They call it the electric hat band. But apparently it's like a pain that circles your head and leaves you dropping on the floor, wetting your pants, just intense, incredible pain, like your skin being ripped off slowly. And if you don't do what they say, that's what they do. That's intense, man. I mean, life is hard enough to live without that kind of shit running the show. And he was actually seeing somebody around this time <clears throat> named Stacy Bailey, who he wound up choking and then told her that he was just joking. It was just a joke. Jim had outbursts and they seemed to be largely directed toward women. His resentment toward his mother as a controlling figure in his life, obviously sort of migrated into his relationship with all women. Yeah, Stacey Bailey was somebody who lived with him for a brief period of time, who ran out of the house fearing for her life. Is this the last sort of relationship like this that he has? Are there other no, there ones? are others. Wow. So in 75 to 76, like we said before, his state starts to become very apparent and the well begins to run dry. You know, you start to look at his work at this time and there's things in there, you know, you're like, whoa, okay, that doesn't really look like something he would have taken just a year ago the theme from the rockford files is that mike post he played all the post gigs mike post got weepy recalling a cue that jim played on a, a rockford file uh, soundtrack that was a better gig but you're right the gig started falling off and he wasn't getting the first call things guys like ed green and rick schlosser and jim keltner were getting the first calls jim was not the irreplaceable totally dependable guy that he had been just a couple years before it was still good work in 76 here at the western That's still good work no he would still go in and cut tracks and it'd be great it's just the dependability issue was not there he started showing up late for things uh he started not playing consistently tracy nelson told me that her producer jimmy bowen who had known jim since the very beginning would only use jim every other day because he didn't think jim had the consistency anymore people like richard perry started using other drummers richard perry never used another drummer lenny warnicker never used other drummers but suddenly the a work started going to other people and Jim was doing commercials, yeah. TV soundtrack, pre-records. He still got uh, Here at the Western World, which is a terrific song with a complicated beat. Uh, Stephen Bishop's Careless, which is, I think, a good record. He's on the first Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers record on one song. Oh, that's an amazing track. Those guys remember that like a car crash they were in. Because here's the deal. Mudcrutch had broken up. There was no heartbreakers. So they decided to do Tom Petty solo sessions. And they call in Al Cooper, Emery Gordy from Emmy Lou Harris's band. They let Campbell play guitar and Petty play guitar. And they bring in Jim. Jim is triple scale. The other guys are all scale. But the heartbreaker guys are like, wow, the guy from Layla? Oh, man. So they cut the first track. It's Stranger in the Night shows up on the first album. But they cut the first track and they go in to listen and they, everybody likes what they hear. And Jim says to the engineer, do you have a couple of spare tracks? Because I can double my drums. 
Patty and Campbell look at each other. They have never heard of anybody doubling their drums. Think about that for a minute. That means every cymbal crash, every paradiddle, every kick drum beat has to be exactly the same. He did it in one take. That's amazing. You go back and listen to that track. I, I definitely will. And you'll go. And first of all, it definitely ain't Stan Lynch. And then second of all, the timbre of the drums, the depth of the percussion is just unbelievable. And it has to be from doubling the part. That's amazing. Okay, that gives me That's a superhuman. Yeah, it is. You know, he's on Beautiful Noise, uh, Neil Diamond's album from that year. A little bit. Yeah, he's on a little bit on that. There's a kind of hush all over the world, rich girl. And then, you know, the last person I want to mention from 76, because it kind of becomes like a possible valedictory comeback thing that never was, was The Pretender with Jackson Brown. Because once 77 hits, we're kind of in a different territory. So this is phase three, really deep in the deep end, 1977 to 1983. The year kicks off with an Alice Cooper record and then Johnny Rivers outside hell. Let's talk about Johnny Rivers' outside help. Well, that's where the uh, outburst happened, where he accused Dean Parks of, of messing with his time. Yeah, things were falling apart by that point, and he was really struggling, and everybody knew it. So he wasn't getting the work, and he ended up going on the road with Burton Cummings. Harry had used him on the Burton Cummings sessions, and Cummings had brought his Canadian band down to Hollywood to record. And the drummer just wasn't making it, and so they replaced the drummer but the other Canadian guys were on the session. And all of a sudden, like to have Jim and the band just elevated everything so much for them that Burton was willing to pay Jim's fee and take him out on the road. Burton Cummings, I should mention, he was the lead singer for Guess Who, which was Canada's most famous rock band. So he was nobody in America, but in Canada, he was a big deal. And so Jim just gets out of Dodge and heads for Winnipeg, music capital of the Western world. In the winter of 77, he's touring Canada with Burton Cummings and struggling to maintain and keep his truck between the gutters and not going up on the sidewalk. He had two tours with Burton. It was relaxing for him because he who was playing with musicians who were not on the same caliber as him. He's not in the studio with Dean Parks and, and Michael O'Marty. And these are Canadian guys. There's Burton's Road Band. And it was easy for him. Right. As long as he could keep it together. And it just got harder and harder the more he was out on the road. And they stopped back in L.A. in between two tours for three days. And Jim called them. Road manager said, I'm not coming out again. So he at this time, I think he was calling his mom and screaming at her to leave him alone. And she had no idea what he was talking about. Right. Jim's mom was very much part of the AA world. And her husband had joined AA in 1958. He died in 1972. But her whole social life was around AA meetings, and she was thoroughly indoctrinated into the 12-step program. Because uh, of the dad or because she was an alcoholic? Al-Anon. Okay, got it. The AA program in the 70s and 80s was pretty rudimentary. They didn't really understand what we've come to call dual diagnosis, which is somebody who is both addicted and mentally ill, poses entirely different problems than somebody who was just addicted. And his mother never realized fully that Jim's problems were beyond drugs and alcohol. She was under the impression that if Jim stopped drinking and using, everything would be all right. I think these screaming sessions on the phone was the fulcrum point for him starting this endless turnstile of hospital visits, right? He went to Van Nuys Psychiatric Hospital. That was the first one. And then after two months, Jim checked himself out against everyone's advice. And that was the first one that there were like a dozen more, right? Yeah, he was very depressed by the lack of progress with his hospital admission. And, and he went home and tried to kill himself. Right. And was readmitted to the hospital hospital. And yeah, there's like 15 hospital admissions in the next few years. He was in and out of mental hospital and drug rehab programs all the time. And he was allowed one bite of food per meal at this point. Yeah, that would happen. And then he'd this go is to a restaurant, he'd order the food, it would come, he'd take a bite. And then the second one would just he'd put it down and leave. It's hard to say, like, I feel bad for a murderer. 
But the image that has stayed with me for many years when I was just doing research on this before I even had a podcast is him starving himself for days and then checking himself into the sportsman's lodge in Studio City with a box of fried chicken and just trying to get as much down as he could before the voices stormed in again. To me, that's an image suffused with so much pain that it complicates your thoughts about this guy. Without going into some of the more sordid details that are in the book, that episode that you describe is minor compared to the torture that he would submit himself to in the coming years. He made his life into a complete horrible hellscape. He could barely bring himself to leave his apartment. When he did, he was overweight, disconnected, kind of scary. And you called him a murderer. I'm not sure that's a fair phrase for Jim. He was mentally ill severely mentally ill. And what happened to his mother was a result of that. He didn't really kill his mother. He silenced his mother. Right, right. From his point of view, he had to. From his point of view, he was being tortured and tormented and beaten into the ground by this voice that he needed to silence. And it was encouraged to by the voice in his head, you've got to kill me. So I sort of like try to avoid the term murderer. It's pejorative to say the least. And Jim's gotten so little compassion because of the shocking nature of his crime. It hits us all in some very deep part of our psyche, the idea of matricide. It's so fundamentally psychologically violating. And people have this incredible emotional reaction to it. Like, he killed his mother, and it's just this horrible thing. And they don't see the years that went behind that. They don't see the 15 hospital admissions. They don't see the intense struggle that this guy had to try and right his capsized ship and sail on into where he was going. To me, it's just one of the most horrifying possible stories that you could find. To be one of the main driven reasons. mad from the point of view that he had, where he was really, as you say, on top of the world. And yet he couldn't enjoy it. He couldn't take satisfaction from it. He couldn't do anything. It was a struggle every step of the way. What you just talked about is the very reason why I'm so excited to read your book, because it's something of a magic trick to change people's perspectives on somebody who kills their mother. You know, I mean, I'm a little bit of the way toward where you are. You're all the way through because you've talked to everybody involved and that kind of thing. Around this time, actually, it's kind of muddy for me. This part in your book, I'm very excited to read because not all the pictures are filled in for me. So the I'm going to fill them in for you. The Spring 78 Jackson Brown tour, what happened there? Because I know that Jackson Brown was rooting for him, really wanted things to work out with Jim. He had to have known this guy is like severely troubled by this point. He didn't. He didn't. Okay. No, Jackson's a, a, a fantastic guy. And he's one of the few people that put out a helping hand to Jim at a time when nobody else did. They brought him in to cut Here Comes Those Tears Again on The Pretender. And he was phenomenal. Yeah. Then Jackson went out and did the uh, album that he recorded recorded live, running on empty. And he recorded it and then put it out. And now he had to go out on tour again to promote that album. But his rhythm section had been booked by James Taylor. So he needed to put together a new rhythm section. He brought Bob Glob in. Now, Bob Glob had been on a session with Jim and Jim had blown up at him. What are you doing? You're messing with my time. You know, it's just scary. But Jackson says to Bob, well, we got to get a drummer. And Bob said, you know, I don't think Jim Gordon's doing much. He's a little nuts, but there's nobody better. So they brought him in for a rehearsal and Jim cooked and David Lindley just fucking loved it. And they took him out. And at this point in Jim's life, he had experienced remission. He'd been attending a daily course in adult development at UCLA. He'd been under some serious treatment with a psychiatrist and he was dialing in his meds. He was living in an apartment in Brentwood. He had a girlfriend. Things were going very well for him. Jackson had no idea that Jim had mental issues. He knew there had been some rehab, but he figured it was a drug and alcohol thing. That was all over the industry at the time, and he, and he didn't see any reason to inquire. So he just like looked at Jim point blank, and Jim was playing great. They ran together during the tour. Jim was on the good foot, started drinking again, and that, you know, began to like leak into the whole thing. But yeah, he completed like three good little tours with Jackson in 78. 
by all accounts, is he spot on? Playing was great. He was not difficult to deal with. There were no incidents. He really kept it together. He didn't return to the fold either. He didn't return to the fold because of his choice or Jackson? I think Kunkel was back. So really, the Jackson Brown tour is the last time that he's able to pull out the stops, right? Did Bob Dylan offer him a spot in the 1979 tour, the gospel tour? Dylan called and wanted him to play, and the voices wouldn't let him. His mother specifically. Mom was definitely down on the drums. And then came Um, Paul Anka. The they, Paul Anka episode where he he called up Anka and Anka sent him the book and they, he went to Vegas and set up for the rehearsal and hit the drum once. And then the voices took over and he looked at the musical director and said, I can't do this and flew home to Los Angeles before the show that night. That was the end of his career. There are a couple other bands that he played in, small time things. I've got some demos if you want to hear them. Yeah, I'd love But to. that was pretty much the end of Jim Gordon, the great session drummer. So Lowell George, Thanks I'll Eat It Here and the Muppets, did that come before the Paul Anka show? Yeah, right around there. Okay. So the Paul Anka thing is really that last hit of the snare was kind of it. That was his take it easy. Yeah, he was gone from the scene for quite a while after that. He met up with with an old friend who convinced him to join a band and they did a few gigs did some rehearsals but when it came time to cut the demos Jim couldn't bring himself to do it so that band ended the friend put another band together and convinced Jim to try that one that one there are some demos from and there were some gigs in Hollywood but it fell apart too any of this stuff remarkable in any way or no no okay the third group was um, a bunch of uh, younger guys that had a kind of R&B flavored band maybe long lines of fabulous thunderbirds and they had a monday night gig in santa monica and and jim joined their band and was playing with them up until like just a few weeks before he killed his mother okay when is it is it 79 or 80 where he just at some point he stops playing music and would go for weeks without bathing or shaving or changing his clothes just watching old movies and writing songs he'd never finish around when is that happening yeah it's it 79 80 81 okay uh 82 so he spends like four years holding on for dear life basically i don't think he could really function i think he was bombarded by voices i think his disease had reached a fever pitch and uh some of the symptoms got completely dramatic really controlling his life in ways that he just couldn't contain at all he thought that his mom wanted him dead because he no longer served served a purpose in the world, right? He had done his job and it was time to leave now. And he thought his mom killed Karen Carpenter and Paul Lind. Yeah, she had some role in their deaths, apparently. She controlled all the doctors that he saw. So this is so twisted. But look, Dave, these voices are generated by his brain, right? So they know everything he's ever done and they know every thought he's ever had these voices are geared to drive him crazy and there's no sympathy there's no cessation it's just full on this force is always going on in his brain it's hard to understand i I spent a lot of time writing the book talking to people who work in mental hospitals with schizophrenics and it's incredibly common disorder one in 100 in the general population. By comparison, multiple sclerosis is one in 10,000. And if you wonder where all these people are, just drive around downtown Los Angeles and look under the freeway overpasses. They're sitting in tents there. Yeah, Jim could function on the level he did. It was astonishing to all the mental health professionals I talked to. They did not understand how he could have the condition he had and still manage to have a professional life that was as demanding and exacting as he did. One of the sad ironies to me is that, from what I understand, he actually killed Osa because she was preparing to move to Portland, Oregon, and her being out of the picture in his mind would give her a more enhanced sense of control over his mind. That's not what he said. He said he was happy she was moving. Oh, okay. He wanted her out of the way. She'd been living in Tahoe, and she'd moved back to Los Angeles, and he didn't dig that at all, but he didn't go see her. Talked to her on the phone a little, but um, he didn't have anything to do with her in real life. Yes, his mother wrote him a letter that he never opened. His brother wrote him a letter that he did read, and that's where he got the news that she was planning on moving. I don't think that bothered him at all. I think he was happy to get rid of her. So at the time of the incident, he's in a band called I-5, was trying to get a record? No, I-5 was 81, 82. It was over by then. I-5 was Jerry Sheff. Danny Timms, 
Larry Rolando and a guy named Steve Moose wrote the songs and sang them. The Blue Monkeys were the band that he was in at the end. The Blue Monkeys? What kind of music mm-hmm. is that? That's Pete Anderson, who would eventually be Dwight Yoakam's record producer. Rolly Sally, Chris Isaac's bass player eventually. And uh, a guy named John Heron on keyboards and a saxophone player named Steve Allen. And they played in this Irish bar every week in Santa Monica. Originals or no? They weren't writers. They had friends that wrote songs and they did some of those things. It was less serious before Jim. Then when Jim joined the band, they got a little bit more serious and started trying to develop some material and they cut some demos. So do you want to talk about June 3rd, 1983? Uh, No, not particularly. Everybody knows what happened. Uh, It was a brutal crime and Jim was arrested at around six in the morning and he never left jail again. He spent 37 years in jail. He was 38 years old when he went in. That's half his life. His professional career lasted about 15 years and it came to a sudden and complete end. One of our listeners, Dennis O'Neill, who's a great guy, he asks, why did he refuse parole and why didn't he participate in music while incarcerated? He did a little, not much. He didn't want to be a drummer anymore. It was just, you know, I I mean, he'd given up his life. No, he didn't want out. I talked to people who who were inside with Jim, and he was uh, remote, cool, not a big presence on the yard, and spent a lot of time in his cell. It is typical of older schizophrenics that they become more withdrawn and more within themselves. Yeah, no, he didn't want parole. He didn't go to his parole meetings. He, He stopped doing his talk therapy when he was up for parole. No, he didn't want out. I'll tell you, there's a lot of scary pictures of Jim because I have this thing about people that look different in every picture. There's something very off-putting to that for me. And Jim is that guy. Every picture, he looks very different. But the one of him in the courtroom, holy shit, man. He looks... A Los Angeles Times photo with him with the beard and everything. Yeah, they, they don't have that. I've been trying to get a copy of that. I've also been trying to get a copy of their mugshot. And get this, the, the records were destroyed within 24 hours of his death. What? I mean, the penal authority in California is useless, inefficient, ridiculous. But they destroy the records for dead prisoners right now. His body wasn't even released. That's crazy. They destroyed the records. Jim's life is such a horrible tragedy. And the finale of Osa's death and his life in prison is just unthinkable. This guy had the most brilliant future anybody could have had. Married to his childhood sweetheart making all this money, doing what he loved, and and being at the top of the world, as you say. And yet he couldn't stay there. He couldn't, he couldn't hold on to it. He couldn't even slide down. He had to fall. And he fell as hard and far as anyone could. There's only two or three stories in music history that are on the same level of tragedy. But, you know, what Jim has that a lot of other people, like, you know, there's other people who uh, it's tragic, but they didn't have the talent. Jim was preternaturally talented. He rewrote the book of drums, and nobody plays drums the same way that they did before Jim Gordon. He added so much vocabulary and so much definition, and there isn't a drummer out there that isn't aware of his work and hasn't incorporated it. And of course, he died just about a month ago at 77 years old on March 13th, 2023. While he was in jail, he attempted suicide a number of times, I believe. Still had the voices. I believe it was his brothers who became the main voice for him and i think still harbored very distant hopes of playing with eric clapton again he would speak about that he spoke about it with a washington post interviewer look the guy was mentally ill i have transcripts of interviews that he did in prison and you read them and you have to really put a filter on so that you can receive what he's actually trying to say because he's mentally ill And his lucidity waxes and wanes, and his ideas of what he's trying to communicate are twisted and bent around. He's still mad at his mother in these interviews. He doesn't have any remorse over what he did, because to him, what he did saved his life. So try and like put those pieces together so that you can see what his reality is, and it's a different world than the one you and I live in. Well, I wrote a little uh, eulogy here. I mean, one of the gifts that this show gives me is to be able to take in the entirety of somebody's work. You get to really feel the arc, the overview and shape of their arc in a way that even the artists themselves might not have understood. So I wrote a very short piece here. So tightly wound as a young one, it seems he would have had to work hard to keep that 
brand of lunacy at bay and away from the watchful eyes of the world. But keep it hid, he did, until the drug scratched that itch wide open, like a gaping wound that just would never close up anymore. The 70s were a staircase that led down for Jim, the 80s even more so. The scariest part of it is that his level of artistry was second to none. He was just the best of the best. And to think that he was able to eke out an existence in the high stakes world of rock and roll in the 70s and hide amongst the day trippers is pretty scary. Most likely there's a Jim Gordon who's insinuated himself in amongst your life too, soldiers. It's just part of the territory these days. And frankly, I believe just as Osa Marie's existence deserves to be celebrated, so too do the lives of the sick and mentally unsound. Jim was a mortifying marvel. I'm glad the man is at rest now. Yeah, well, the voices are gone, that's for sure. we got to feel good about him being free from that. Yeah. Now, is the book coming out in February? February. I am ludicrously psyched about this book. I have a four-year-old, so I don't get to read very much, but I think I'll put him up for adoption until I'm done reading it. <laughs> <laughs> four-year-old? You got yeah, started yeah. late on that, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I, I didn't find my wife till I was knocking on death's door. <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, we've had authors on the show and I've read their work, but I've read multiple books of yours. Joel is the real deal. If you haven't read his stuff, I can say for sure that the Altamont book, the Sly book, I'm sure the other books that I mentioned at the top of the show. And then also, I would recommend to you the Burt Burns biography. That's the next one? Here Comes the Night. Now, I published that in 2014. You think that's the next one I should read based on... Oh, yeah. If if you're a fan, that's some of my very best work. It's an amazing story along the lines of Jim Gordon. Yeah, I would love to read it because uh, I wrote my essay to get into college on Astro Weeks and its importance in my life. Well, you text me a mailing address and I'll stick one in the mail to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll get you back with something awesome, okay? Not to worry. I appreciate your interest. So this has been awesome. This has been the fruition, actually, of a dream for me for many, many years. So thank you. My pleasure, Dave. We'll be in touch. All right, that about does it. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason. Joel Selvin, Diversion Books, the publisher of Selvin's forthcoming Drums and Demons, The Tragic Journey of Jim Gordon, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the Soldiers of Sound. I love every last one of you, and this show would not exist without you, my friends. Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, the ability to pitch questions to guests, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator, and much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And if you don't mess with the Zuck, hey, no sweat. Just email me at info at discograffiti.com and I'll keep you in the loop. So now that it's done and you want more, another way to dive even deeper into the limitless wonders of skewed 1960s hippie living is to go straight to the beginning and listen to Pink Floyd, Episodes 1 and 2, The Monkees, Episodes 22 and 23, The Band, Episodes 25 and 27, The Zombies, Episodes 59 and 60, Sweetwater, Episodes 79, and Burt Summer, Episodes 83 and 84. But wait just a minute. This is just the entrance to the rabbit hole. Join us as we descend down, down, down on Discography's week-long Back When the Drugs Definitively Stopped Working Deep Dive. Of course, if you're a Patreon subscriber, then you already know to keep your ears peeled throughout the week, because this Monday brings the Patreon-only wildcard episode, Alan Arkish's Fillmore Feast 4, wherein the venue shutters its doors and Alan embarks on the early stages of an incredible decades-long career in film. Not to mention Wednesday's incredible Patreon-only episode of Discography's The Top Ten. This week's list features the indomitable Joe Kennedy and reflects Jim Gordon most decidedly on The Descent. It's the top 10 bands that stuck around past their due date. Make sure you visit patreon.com slash discograffiti and check out the thematically related deep dive as a music obsessive's way of life. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, August 18th, we got something very special for you. 
We're coming at you with one of the most unique and unforgettable interviews you will ever hear in your entire life. Terry Kirkman and Jules Alexander, the two founding members of the association, took part in a 13-hour, four-part interview in which they rated everything they've ever done. And I have finally edited this thing. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss this. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography Deep. 